Okay, we are going to be studying this morning from Psalm Psalm 8. Psalm 8. So let's go to God in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to study your word. And Father, we ask you to please be with us as we study. Help us, Father, to see what your word is saying. Help us to to recognize this psalm that shows your love for us. And Father, we want to give you the praise because of that. Help us to always appreciate the position that you have put us in, in your creation. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Okay, we are studying a, a very well-known psalm, Psalm 8. Uh, it's well-known because Jesus quotes from it after he uh, uh, does his little deal with the temple in Jerusalem. There's Bob. Good deal. Good morning. How you doing, Robert? Doing good. How about you? Ready to go. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. We're in Psalm 8. Psalm 8. Just getting started. Uh, but this is this psalm is uh, probably best known because of what how Jesus quotes from it after he uh, um, does what he does at the temple, um, turns over the tables, chases the money changers out, um, and uh, and the children uh, and the children uh, say something that upsets the Pharisees and the chief priests. Let's read the psalm first. And then we'll, we'll go through it. And uh, that's not the only thing this psalm obviously has to offer. But uh, as I said, that may be where you know it the best. Ah, morning, Mom. Glad you're here. Okay, let's read the psalm. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries, to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the sea, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Morning, David. Good to see you. Okay. First thing to note, and it's real easy to note because we just read the last verse and we started with the first word, verse. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? I mean, he repeats his statement in verse 9 of how he started out what we call verse 1 of, of the book of Psalms. Of, I mean, I'm sorry, of, of Psalm 8. Um, as you know, those of you who have had me teach before, have heard me say these words before, I like to call this, and I didn't make it up, someone else made it up, and I, and I stole it, but I, but I like to call this a sandwich. Everything in between those two phrases, phrases are the proof of why God is majestic. His name is majestic in all the earth. It should be the reason why all humans, all mankind, feel this way about God, and much more, by the way. It's not limited to what the psalmist says here. But the psalmist has a point he's wanting to make. He has a reason in this psalm that he's wanting to glorify God. We know in other psalms there are other reasons why, why the psalmist glorifies God. But David has this as his reason in Psalm 8. And we're going to be noting the, major, the specific reason that David mentions. But, but let's look at the second part of, of, verse, of verse 1. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Let's, let's look at that first part again. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Remember that idea of name. It certainly does, it certainly does speak of you know, God's name as a wonderful name. It's one that we should certainly look up to. But understand that name also shows authority. Um, and and you'll, you'll find that in, uh, 
in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do all with his authority. Well, God has a, a and well, and, and, and one other place in uh, Philipp, uh, Philippians. Let me turn there so I don't mess this one up. I want to get exactly how it's said. In Philippians chapter chapter 2, um, when it's talking about the, hum, the, the, hum, the humility of Jesus Christ, I want to start with verse five, but what I what I want uh, what what I'm wanting is going to be in verses nine and ten. Um, have you, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now notice, morning David, good to see you. Now notice here that um, Jesus Christ, his, his name, he became obedient, emptied himself, becoming a man, coming in the form of a servant, becoming a man. So he, he, he lowered himself down from what he is and emptied himself of all the perks to go with it of being God. He didn't stop being God but he emptied himself of the perks of being God and become a servant in the form of a servant into a man. Now, in Philippians, this is a very humble thing that he did to to lower himself to the level of becoming a man. And I don't want and and remember that when we get back to Psalm 8, all right? I don't want to go any further with that right now. But in doing so and being obedient and dying on the cross, God lifted him up so his name is above every other name. Of course, in 1 Corinthians 15, we come to find out that his name is not above the Father's name, but it's the idea of all other names. His name is over, is above them. Okay, But in that regard, we see how the word name is being used. Authority. He is higher than. That idea. Go back to Psalm 8, verse 1, once again. So how majestic is your name in all the earth? Well, his is so majestic, it's even above his son's now. All right, Jesus' name was on the same level as the Father, but he emptied himself, become a man, and then he, he was lifted back up. And as I said in 1 Corinthians 15, we find out that he is still under subjection with the Father. All right, you can look at... Chapter 15 is a very long chapter. I don't have the time to go through and, and look and see what verse that is. But in chapter 15, we see those words that he is still in submission to the Father today and will be, by the way, it would seem from 1 Corinthians 15, for eternity. That's where we leave Jesus Christ. But it certainly is above our names. He certainly is authority over us. Now, having said that, the, the rest of this psalm, we're going to be seeing the position that God has put mankind in, which is a very high position within his creation. Okay, So note with me, if you will, uh, uh, let me read verse one again. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. Okay, Now he's, he's talking about the power of God here. You have seen his splendor. In the, in the nighttime sky, okay? Oh, verse 27, Annette, thank you. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, verse 27. Appreciate that, Annette. Uh, is where we find out that Jesus is, is still under, and will be under submission to God, okay? Good deal. I love it. I love it when I have people that will help me out like that when I'm trying to find a verse. Thank you. Um, so so uh, God's splendor is seen in his creation, this is a remnant to what we see in uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, when, when, uh, when God, God makes it clear through Paul the Apostle, God is angry because what's known about him can be seen in his creation, his power, 
his, his abilities can be seen in his creation. There has to be a God because this could not possibly have come, come together all by itself. And so, um, and so that is what the psalmist is saying. You've displayed your splendor in the heavens, your power, your ability, your majesty in the heavens. Now, verse 2. Verse 2 is, a, like I said, is a quote, or Jesus quotes from this, uh, verse 2. Let me uh, hold your hand right here and turn with me to, to Matthew 21. And, uh, and I especially want you to hold your hand here because I am going to, we're going to read verse 2 again and then flip over to 21, uh, verse, uh, verse 16, and see how Jesus quotes from this. Matthew 21, verse 16. So let me get there so I can I can do this. There we go. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I'm going to start with verse 14 when we get back there. But let's read verse 2. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Remember that last part of that verse as well. We're going to see Jesus' enemies speaking up against and denouncing something before him. They, of course, were believing that they were, that they were pointing out a blasphemy that was being said. But Jesus goes back to this psalm to show that what was being said was true and needful. Okay, go back to go over to Matthew 21 now. Verse 14 through 17. What I want is the quote in verse 16. Okay. And the blind and the lame claimed to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he was doing, he, I'm sorry, saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. And they said, do you hear what these children are saying? Now stop right there for a second. What did it mean when they said Hosanna to the son of David? What does the son of David specifically mean in this context? Christ. Yeah, exactly. He's pointing to the Messiah. The word, the Greek word Christos is what we have for Christ, the anointed one. The, Eng the Hebrew word Mashiach is, the, is what we translate Messiah. Okay, so you have, you have their saying, the, and, and that phrase, son of David, is when specifically used like this, every, anyone who was a descendant of David was a son of David. But the son of David was the one they were waiting, the son of David was the one they were waiting for to sit on David's throne. All right, so they're saying, Hosanna, in the, Hosanna to the Christ, to the Messiah. All right, you can see how this would mess with the with the uh, chief priests, the Pharisees would not care for that a bit. All right, and so so the chief priests specifically and the scribes. And sorry, I'm, I mentioned the Pharisees. Sure, they didn't like it either. But the scribes and the chief priests, <clears throat> that's the Sanhedrin, is what we're talking about. Did not care for what was being said. Okay, and so Jesus says this, and he quotes from Psalm eight. And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise for yourself. Now, that's a that's a quote from the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And Jesus basically endorses that translation by quoting from it. And so when we look at our, our, our translation from the Hebrew into English in, in Psalm 8, we see, G, we see the psalmist say, from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength. Well, Jesus makes it clear that this is a better translation as what was being said. This is what was being meant by the fact that he quotes from the Septuagint, which is a man-made translation of the, of the Old Testament. Okay, so out of the mouth of babes, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself. Okay, God accepts, you know, it, it takes a growing up to stop believing 
in a God, <laughs> uh, sadly, of growing up as far as, uh, as far as the worldly mind sees it. You grow up and you stop believing in superstitions. Well, that's what our society says. Well, children very easily believe in a power bigger than themselves because pretty much every power is bigger than themselves. It takes, it takes growing up and deciding you're self-sufficient to stop believing in a, in a God. All right. I saw your hand there, Bob. One second. Let me finish this thought, and I'll, 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 I'll ask you what, what you have. Um, so, so look at what he's saying. Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself. They recognize there's a God. The fact of what they see around them. It's, it's real easy for them to believe in a God. We've talked about this before. It's real easy for the, for the uh, people in undeveloped countries to believe in a God. You're not going to find atheists in un, under, undeveloped countries because they recognize the world. It takes an education to become an atheist, an, an education in human, humanistic ideas to become an atheist. People believe in a God naturally. And so children notice it. Okay, Bob, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Brother Kaufman makes the observation here that he refers to babes mm -hmm. and uh, makes the possible connection to Moses, the babe in the bulrushes, mm -hmm. and the yeah. babe in the manger Yeah. By, by those two that he delivered his people. Yeah, yeah. The, the, idea, the idea of babies certainly being involved in uh, in in the bringing about, and that's and and one could sit there and say, well, yeah, Moses had to be a baby before he was a man, and Jesus had to be a baby before he was a man, and be, and become be able to die on the cross, and that's true. But it's for, through babies that salvation has come into the world. Okay, and and we we need to recognize that fact, and 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 again, Jesus is using it to say these little children know better than you chief priests do, <laughs> you know, and you scribes do. These little baby knows better than you do. And so he's, he's basically making a point, and in, in a sense, he's, he's calling them less than babies. Okay, so, so he goes on to say, and I wanted to get that last part now, because of your adversaries, the reason these children are calling out, God uses it against the, the scribes, and against the chief priest to make the enemy and revengeful cease. Okay, Jesus Christ was constantly bringing the leaders of God's people at that time, bringing them up short, and he does it here by quoting by quoting from the Psalms about these these children. Okay, and you don't see them say another word at that point. Now, that doesn't stop them from coming up again later on. But you don't see him saying another word at that point in this regard. Um, Nanette says, another thing is that babies do not, do not lie. They learn the ability later as they grow older. Yeah, yeah, they learn. A, yeah, I know what you're saying about that. Um, yeah, they're very honest uh, until they understand maybe they can get a, out of trouble with something by not being honest. But yeah, little children... Are, are very innocent in a lot of different ways. I know there's a lot of religions out there that don't want to believe that, that don't believe that, but God uses children, and we need to become innocent like children. So good point, Nanette. Now, the rest of the book, uh, the rest, rest of the psalm is incredible for mankind. Remember what I said a few moments ago about, uh, about Philippians chapter 2? It basically puts us in our place as far as God is concerned. We are servants of his. Jesus Christ was equal with the Father, and then he came to earth and took the, took the form of a servant, a man, a servant of God. By the way, that's what all of creation is. All of creation is there for God's purpose. All of creation recognizes and recognizes God as creator understands that he has the right to decide what to do with what he has made okay so the fact that the fact that it says he took on the form of a servant is not if he would have took on the form of a rock he would have taken on the form of a of a of a lesser 
than God the Father. If it had taken on the form of a bird, he would have taken on a lesser than God the Father. Same thing with becoming a, a man, lesser than God the Father. But in becoming a man, he became the greatest of all creation. Look at what it says here. Verse 3, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have it ordained. This is drawing off of what he said at the end of verse 1 who, who, about God. You have displayed your splendor above the heavens. Well, now he's saying, when I consider those things, they, they speak about how great God is, verse 1. But when I consider those things, the work you have done, the moon and the stars that you have ordained, this is what I consider. Look at verse 4. What is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man that you care for him. Now that phrase son of man was, was a favorite thing that Jesus called himself. This is not speaking of Jesus, however, alone. It speaks of him because he, he became a man. But the, uh, the son of man is a human. Okay, that's all the phrase means. It's basically repeating the, the same thing he said in the top part of, part of verse 4. He's saying it in ver at the bottom part of verse 4. By the way, Ezekiel called himself son of man. Each one of us men can call ourselves sons of men. Uh, women, you can call yourselves daughters of men. You know, it, it just merely means you are human. That's all it means. And uh, the son of a the son of a dog is a puppy, the son of a cat is a kitten, the son of a fish is a fish. All right, the son of man is a man is a human. Not that that's not the word for male here. It's a word for human. Okay. Um, so, so what is man that you take thought of him? Now here's the here's the the lowering down in David's own thoughts about himself. I am lowly. Why are you taking thought of me? You are, you are way up there. You have created this incredible universe. There's stars and suns and moons and whatever in the sky that I can't even comprehend how it's possible to make such a thing. And you think of us. You think of us above those things. Um, in fact, go on with verse, verse 5. Yet you have made him, man, Kind, humans, yet you have made man a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. Now, this is saying the same thing we see in Philippians, just in a little bit of a different light. In Philippians, Jesus Christ became a little bit lower than God, and so he's a servant. Um, and uh, here, we were made a little bit lower than God, and what? You make him rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All right? We are the highest of creation. And by the way, if you take with that, oh, morning, Joan. Good to have you with us today. And if you take with it what is said in Hebrews, hold your hand right here. I love this. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. I don't want to just refer to it. I want to read this. Many people don't know this. They think that angels are above humans. Well, maybe in some ways they may be, but in one way, at least, and I believe in the psalmist is making it clear that creation is under us and angels are creation. Look at what it says. What was that, Jolie? That camera's working. Oh, I, oh, I was Pat. Okay. Okay. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Speaking in verse 13, in verse 13, we see that they're speaking of angels. He's speaking of angels. Let me read verse 13 with it. But to which angels did he ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? This is showing that Jesus Christ is above the angels. All right. That's what Hebrews chapter 1, the latter part of Hebrews chapter 1 is dealing with. Jesus Christ is higher than the angels. So that's good. But look who the angels are servants of. Verse 14. And let me read 13 again with it. But to which of the angels did you ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they, the angels, not all ministering spirits sent out to render service 
for the sake of those who inherit salvation. Now, just like Jesus becoming a man took on the form of a servant, angels are servants. They're servants of God, but not just servants of God. Let me read that again. Are they, angels, not all ministering spirits, sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Angels are servants of man. Serving God by serving men. Okay. Yes, Bob. And I heard, <clears throat> found a, a quote about verse fourteen, mm -hmm. and I couldn't find out who who said it, but it's this is the quote: "Amidst the vastness around me, I am lost, and can be of no more consequence than a moat in a sunbeam. If I and all my generation were swept away in the twinkling of an eye." We would be no more missed than a grain of dust blown into the crater of a volcano. <laughs> we, but I tell you what, I tell you one thing: we would be missed by God. Sure. God, God for some reason, wants to be with us for eternity. I, I, I don't comprehend it. After what mankind has done to him, I don't comprehend it. But I, I know what you're saying. We are we are nothing compared to God. But God loves us, and that's what the psalmist is saying. What is man that you take thought of him? All right? He is the highest of creation, even being served by angels. We see there in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter chapter 1. I need to correct you here. Yes. You said that he is highest of creation. He is the creator. I meant mankind. Did I say God? Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, I was quoting, what is man that you take thought of him? And then I said, he is, yeah, I'm glad you, please, I'm glad you said that. I was meaning that quote in verse four. What is man okay. that you take thought of him? He is the highest of all creation. You most certainly need to create, uh, correct me if I said God is created. You're absolutely right. Man is the highest of creation. God is over man. Most certainly, he's over all creation. Okay, thank, thank you, honey. Thank you. I looked at something in verse 5 2 that uh, Brother Coffin notes mm -hmm. is that the Septuagint was an error when he, uh, and read King James uh, a little lower than the angels, wherein the, uh, the Septuagint was wrong in their translation of this that that angels is actually Elohim, Elohim. or God. Yeah, in fact, my translation does say God. In verse mm -hmm. five, uh, yet you have made him a little lower than God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly right. Yeah, there's. You know, that's one of, one of the places I guess where the King James followed the Septuagint. The Septuagint wasn't yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I believe doesn't. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to. Never mind. I don't want to go there. I'm, I'm already probably getting okay. close on my time. So so let let, let me go ahead. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. That should say God there. Now, so there's the question. What is man that you take thought of him? And I, and I, re, and I want to emphasize that question. This shows what God, God desires for whatever reason. God desires to be with man. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. What is man that you take thought of him? To that extent... That you put you put mankind's needs above your son's comfort and life even. What is man that you take thought of him? The psalmist is going to talk about man being the highest. Ten minutes? Okay. The psalmist is going to be talking about the man is the highest of creation. But man was even saved by the blood of God's son. Bob? That's that's noted in several in several places, like that, if he notes when a sparrow falls to the earth, he'll yeah. sure, surely notice about man. Yeah. And and I believe it was Isaiah that said, "He knows me by name." Yeah. That's yeah. personal. That is. That is. And by the way, let me hold your hand right here and go backwards now. Go back to Genesis, chapter nine. Genesis chapter nine. What, what uh, Bob just mentioned about the sparrow, if a sparrow falls to earth, God, know, God knows it. So how much, how much more important are you than the sparrow? All right. Um, 
look at what it says in, in Genesis chapter 9. Start with verse 3. This is following man coming out of the ark, and, and uh, God, is, God is making a covenant with him. He's going to make the covenant of the rainbow that he'll never bring floodwaters on the earth again. But look at what it says starting in verse 3. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I have given the green plant. So animals are there for man to eat now. Only you shall not eat the flesh with its life that is its blood, not to eat blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. Now, did you notice what it said there about animals? Not only the fact that animals, God's going to require their life for killing a man. All right. But it also says, and man can kill animals all he wants and eat them. Albert Brown's translation, but read what it says in verse 3 and 4. Can't You can't eat their blood because God doesn't want uh, his people eating their blood, but you can eat them. You can use them. You are the highest of creation. Now, there, now don't, don't get the idea that I'm thinking that it's okay to torture animals or it's okay to be, you know, God, God has certain things he says about the way we're supposed to treat his creation. And that's another study for another time. But... They're there for our using. This question of whether or not animals are on the same level as man is answered by God himself. No, they are not. Man is not held accountable for the blood of animals, for animals dying. Animals are held accountable for man dying at their, by their power. Okay, we can kill an animal because it kills a man. Okay, the, that idea, God requires that blood of, of the animal. And so recognize when we look at that, when we look at Psalm 8 again, we are the highest of creation. Hey, Michael, good to have you here. Stop that. Paul makes that observation about, about animals, too, when he wrote to First Timothy mm -hmm. and uh, and chapter 4 and verse 4, that everything that he made is good yeah. to be received with thanksgiving. That's right, exactly. Mankind can do that. Um, look with me, if you will, at uh, then, verse 4. What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him rule to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. We just saw a few moments ago that God put all things under Christ's feet. All right? But man has all things in creation under his feet. God is over us, but, but man is over all creation. Um, you have put all things under his feet. Verse 7 all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea, it all belongs to us, to be used by us, to be food for us, to be, to be clothing for us, to be whatever we want it to be for us. Humanistic ideas make it sound like, I mean, you have people wanting to put up a monument for a truckload of chickens that got killed when it, when it crashed. As, if you would, as you would put a monument up for a human being that died. You can, uh, there's nothing wrong with remembering animals that died, but the idea of putting them on the same level of a human being is wrong. I love my dogs. I do. They're part of my family. Understand something. They're part, I consider them to be part of my family. But I do not hold them on the same level as, a human, as human beings. Although sometimes you may think I do. <laughs> because of the way I feel about them. But they're not on the same level as human beings. They are wonderful companions. And, I, and God, God loves them. 
Remember, he sees the sparrow in the sky. Not one falls to the ground without him knowing about it. So please, I'm not, this is not one to down animals. It's one to bring man up to the level that mankind is at. Okay? Um, so this is, what, this is why the psalmist, this is why David says what he does in the beginning of the psalm and at the end of the psalm. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Not just because of his creation, but because of the wonders of him putting us on the same level. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, putting us above everything else in his creation. Just one step below God. How'd I do? Time-wise. Time-wise. Doing good? <laughs> What's that? You have three minutes. Three minutes? Wow. I can give a long prayer. <laughs> you can get the end of the prayer now. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. Any other comments now, on this? Howard, there's yeah. one thing that yeah. you, you just mentioned about putting uh, animals on the same level as, as humans, which right. is wrong. Amen. And I have the same thoughts when I see those TV commercials begging for funds to take care of animals but you don't see anything about the abortion and oh. taking care of that and that, that goes through me about every time i see that or the idea or the idea of making it illegal to destroy an eagle egg yeah mm -hmm. but you can destroy a human life yeah. with no thought with no thought at all but they you, celebrate it yeah they celebrate it exactly Exactly. Think about what God thinks about that. Let's go to God. I'm sorry. Another comment. Oh, There's, that's that's one thing that he that he mentions in that uh, in Psalms. Uh, I forgot the verse now. There's seven things God hates that he mentions in there. Those who shed innocent blood. Yeah. Proverbs chapter six, verses sixteen through nineteen. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Morning, morning, Robert. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. We'll be closed. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word. And we ask you, Father, to please help us to recognize the wonderful blessing it is that you have put us in the position you have in your creation. Why you love us, Father, so much is beyond my understanding. But I appreciate it. And I ask you, Father, to please help me never to forget it and to never take it for granted, and to give you the glory that you deserve because of it, and because you're God, the glory you deserve. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your Son's name we pray this prayer. Amen.